Good morning. I want to welcome everybody to the World Economic Forum panel on uh, energy transformation. Uh, a warm welcome to everybody here in the room in Davos and to everybody who's watching uh, this discussion on the web. Our subject is the energy transformation and it's certainly a very topical time to do that. Uh, a month ago, the Paris Conference uh, on climate change came out with a really a historic consensus involving almost 200 countries to move quickly to an energy transformation. Uh, it comes at a time when solar prices have dropped dramatically. Uh, they're way down, but oil prices are really way down. So this provides the context and the challenge, of course, of moving uh, uh, energy transformation, a change in the energy system. Uh, the, the numbers demonstrate uh, what a challenge it is. Uh, today, 80% of world energy, more or less, comes from oil, uh, uh, coal, and natural gas. 1.1% uh, from wind and solar. So a transformation is a very big job. And our discussion this morning is aimed at trying to understand what's involved in that transformation, what's happened, and what can happen. We have a terrific panel to uh, join us in the discussion. Uh, Fadi Barol, who is the executive director of the International Energy Agency, enormously experienced in these questions. Mr. Hiroaki Nakanishi, who is the uh, chairman and CEO of Hitachi. Uh, Eric Lin Lu, who's the CEO of Shengfen International Clean Energy, at the very forefront of uh, solar and uh, solar technology and development. And of course, Ignacio Sanchez Galan, the chairman and CEO of Iberdrola, which is the world's largest operator uh, of wind, whether and in Europe, in North America, in Latin America, and brings experience <coughs> in that sector, uh, renewables really going back to 2001 and uh, really going back to the foundation of your company 120 years or so ago when it started with hydropower. So we have a lot to cover. We will have a discussion among ourselves and then we'll open up uh, to the audience and, and bring you into the discussion. But we have to start with uh, Fadi Barol. Uh, uh, oil, uh, what's happening? And then the second question after you tell us what's happening, I think we heard the phrase a wash in, in, a, in a supply of oil. Uh, what do these low oil prices mean and natural gas prices mean for renewable development that might be different than a year ago? Fati. Mm -hmm. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dan, and good morning uh, to everybody. Yes, uh, we are seeing a downward pressure on the uh, oil prices, and it seems that 2016, this downward pressure uh, will likely to continue. Why? Very simple. Since three years, we have more supply than the demand. So we have a lot of oil in the markets, and when we look at the 2016, I don't see any factors which could make a big surprise and push the prices up. So this is a few implications, and if I can choose two of them, one on the oil markets, the second on the, the topic of this discussion, the transformation of energy. For the oil markets, what worries me the most uh, is then, we, last year, we have seen oil investments, 2015, to decline more than 20% compared to 2014 for the new projects. And this was the largest drop we have ever seen in the history of uh, oil. And moreover, 2016, this year, with a $30 price environment, we expect an additional 16% decline in the oil projects, oil investments. So we have never seen two years in a row, oil investments declining. If there was a decline one year, which was very rare, the next year there was a rebound. So what does that lead you to? This leads me to the very fact that in a few years of time, when the global demand gets a bit stronger, when we see that the high cost areas, such as the United States, starts to decline, we may well see an upward pressure on the prices as a result of market tightening. So my message, the first message is, don't be misled that the low oil prices 
they will have an impact on the investments, therefore, in the okay. oil markets well, in the few years uh, of time. Just to put a number on that, in our numbers at IHS, 2015 to 2020, we see a, now a $1.8 trillion decline <coughs> in uh, upstream oil and gas investment. But let's turn it now. What does this mean for the energy transformation? What does it mean for Paris? So when we talk about the energy transition in Paris, there are many <laughs> factors, but two of them are important. One, renewable energy. The other one is energy efficiency. So uh, both, especially under energy efficiency, we have seen major improvements in the last few years. But to be very frank, a big chunk of this energy efficiency policies were not necessarily driven by the environmental factors. It, they, they did play a role, but more to save money, to save a uh, cost of energy. Therefore, the high energy prices gave an impetus to energy efficiency improvements. And what I'm scared, is that with the low oil prices, low energy prices, that push on energy efficiency may not be as strong as we have seen in the last few years of time. Therefore, a warning to the governments, don't get too relaxed, continue to push the energy efficiency button, including the transportation sector, buildings and the others. And for renewables, the uh, life will not be uh, very easy, to be honest with you, with the low oil and low natural gas prices, because the gas prices are also mm. uh, very low today. When you look at the Asia Pacific, right. it was $20 dollars two years ago. It is less than $6 dollars now. So gas and renewables are in competition. Mm. If you want to see renewables to have a real share in the global energy mix, we need to continue uh, the renewable projects, especially those which makes economic sense. So let me ask you, Mr. Galan, uh, low oil prices, low natural gas prices, Governments pulling subsidies back from uh, renewables. Uh, what does that mean for your, your renewable business? Well, I, I think our investment is already, we are, when we take a decision, we are thinking in 40, 50, 60 years time. I think the importance of uh, the COP21 is then finally, the worldwide has already recognized that the problem exists. Fatih and myself, we have already talked about that very many times. So. The world recognizes that the problem exists and they have to make solution. And the main solution is that uh, we need to electrify more the economy. I think one of the, uh, the agreements or the things of the point that has been agreed in Paris is that even in the electricity sector, it's only responsible of 28% of the emission. But we have technologies for improving uh, dramatically the emission we are making today. We can move from coal to gas or from gas to wind or from wind to solar. And I think that the, 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 the emission can already be reduced by half, by three times, and even we can already achieve but a so moment do, the no. Do these lower <coughs> prices really matter to you? Well, I think when we make our profile, we are not thinking in the short term. I think two years, three years for an industry, what our, the life of our asset is 40, 50, 60 years. It's, I think we have power plants <coughs> has been built by grand grandparent in, 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 in 1903, which they still are there. And, so, and, and operating well. <coughs> And operating well. So I think we are looking long, long term, and I think this period certain is not helping. So do you see other <coughs> utilities now more following what you, the path you launched in 2001? Well, I think the investment in renewable has not reduced worldwide, has already increased, they continue increasing. And I think there one point very simple, is if we put price to the carbon, we also the main things, I think automatically these technologies can already reduce the support which is already given today. So, so do you think that's the key thing that post Paris needs to happen is a price on carbon? Well, I think certain. If we are not putting price in carbon, it should be very difficult to switch from technologies, in certain cases the fossil fuels, which are today are receiving more subsidies than all renewables worldwide. They are, the subsidies we are receiving, the fossil fuels worldwide, are twice the subsidies which are received four, four times. Four times. So well, four but, times. That, but that includes, when you say so, subsidies, you're including the, the <coughs> discounted prices in countries, if you take that out. Exactly. It is $500 billion for fossil fuels and $120 billion for renewable energies. Right. So but if that disappears automatically... Well, we, see, we see a lot of the countries now backing out of their subsidies to uh, oil in the, in the emerging markets. Well, I think if that is reduced and this uh, 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 already given a bet to the to renewables, or even not, is just Good. putting a price to carbon. That's but it. So, so let me just ask one other thing on subsidies before we leave the subject. As you say, you note the imbalance. What was the impact and the economic downturn 
of the pulling back in Spain and other countries of subsidies or incentives to renewables. Is that, had, is that, are you still seeing the effect of that? Well, in most of the countries are already just uh, making a trend for making the disaster disappear in the medium term. I think the technologies are already making uh, 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 improvements such they are becoming competitive without the support. But, I insist on that one, but we need, we need already a level play field. Renewable cannot compete right. with fossil fuels when fossil fuels are subsidized. I give you the example of Spain. Carbon, look, uh, carbon, the national coal is subsidized. How to compete renewable with a national coal subsidized? It's impossible. But you're doing it. Well, uh, we, we do because we had already in the past certain kind of support, but not for the new one, it's very difficult to compete. So let's, let's go to the cost of renewables. Uh, the really dramatic thing is, of course, is the dramatic drop in the uh, price of solar energy. Mr. Liu, uh, how much of this, and of course China is now the largest manufacturer, how much of this is a result of overcapacity in Chinese manufacturing? How much is technology advanced? And how much is sheer scale? Can you sort it out for us? Dan, thank you. I think it's, uh, it's very difficult to quantify exactly the percentage. But I think it's a, it's a combination of the scale, scale including manufacturing scale and also supply chain scale and supply chain efficiency and also the technology innovation and plus the, the high efficiency conversion. So as, it, as you know, the Chinese solar manufacturing, the cost wise has dropped by over 75% for the last couple of years. Right. And it's continued on the track, like uh, Mr. Bolo said, it's not just the manufacturing cost itself, but also the efficiency has been beefed up dramatically. The 60 piece cell panel when I joined the SunTech Power five years ago, it's only 180, 185 watt per panel. But the same cell, same square, square area today, average is 260. So you look at it from 185 watt per panel to 260 for the same area surface. So do you expect to see continuing innovation? Of course. And uh, we had a meeting uh, last week in China. We are seeing the 25% continue drop within the next five years for the solar panel. And also, which means 25%, the EPC cost for the area right. related like land and also the systems. And on top of that, we also, the conversion efficiency is gonna be high. Uh, we say it's gonna be 20 to 35% higher for the next five decades. Wow, yeah. so, US. So where, do, so where does solar fit into China's overall electricity mix in the future? Solar I, and renewables. Solar and renewables, by, by 2030, China has a committed over 25%. That's a, that's a, that's a minimum. We, we see and we where, where are you now? Right now, I, we are at 1.5% to, to 2%. So that's a lot. Yeah, quickly. that's right. We, we, China has defined what they call 13th, 50 years plan. I think the solar and renewable energy has become the national strategy for the, for the focus. As we mentioned before, the, before this session, uh, where China is going in terms of economics is a hot topic for this forum. Uh, China is not going to invest in infrastructure, real estate related cement, uh, uh, the, the metal and the steel, but the renewable energy is, is a clear target. How much of the new emphasis in China on renewables is a result of the climate change discussions and how much of it is a result of urban pollution? I think, I think both. I think the, China, the middle class has become more and more. They, people not just enjoy the, the physical rich, but they all enjoy clean air, clean soil, and clean water, right? So government has a, has a lot of pressure from me, like an average consumers. We, we want everything to be clean. I think that's, uh, it's become probably more and more it's political right. just versus the, the right. reality, yeah. So Mr. Nakanishi, uh, one of the concerns that you have is, is that solar and renewables grow, there's an issue of how do you manage them and integrate them into the systems. Uh, Hitachi is a great technology company. Tell us how you see that problem. Yeah, the, the really that's such kind of the renewables, uh, the characteristics is are really unstable, it depend on the weather. And also that uh, how to manage of the, uh, the total supply is one of the key factor from the electric grid operation. So that uh, smart grid, uh, already we have the 10 years history, but we don't have a clear result of the efficiency improvement yet. So that we need to 
invest of the from the viewpoint of the demand side, uh, supply side, the uh, more um, the renewables integrated in a one total grid operation. That is one of the point, and also that uh, the, from the viewpoint of the efficiency, you already talk about that. The demand side control is a very strong weapons to making a clear ef efficient operations, especially that the consumer buildings or those area. So those two requires a more systematic approach, uh, how to manage of the other uh, electric grid, uh, how to making a more efficient operations of uh, total schemes. But now the, each country has its own the utility operation schemes, how to the, the adjusting of the, uh, the, the real real cost and the, the fares and, and, and also that some intensive scheme. Those are very much you know, important political issues. Right now, that uh, today, this time, the World Economic Forum is focused on uh, the fourth uh, the industrial revolutions. That is, uh, digitization, uh, such a systematic approach, allows us to enjoy of those kind of the efficiency improvement very dynamically. So that uh, the, as a manufacturer, Hitachi really would like to contribute to this type of approach in uh, every country, every uh, the areas. And do you see that, I mean, is this happening at sufficient speed to keep pace with the growth of renewables? Right now, the, uh, in Japan, we have a big challenge to increase of the, uh, the renewables very dynamically. But uh, in, the, in the case of the Japan, we have to change of the, uh, the electric utility schemes, very much in a specialized, regional, monopolized, so, so the deregulations, new schemes of the how to compete among us, and setting up the, uh, the more dynamic combination of the various energy sources. That's our target. So that will allow us, within the five years, <coughs> the more dynamic efficiency improvement so that we do not uh, expect of the, uh, uh, the increase of the right. power consumption. Right. So let me ask Mr. Galan, as renewables get to be a larger and larger scale, uh, the grid has to be managed differently. Mr. Nakanishi is talking about that, absolutely, or does it? Absolutely. Blackout has already come for lack of power or for excess of power. So I think if you're not managing well, you can already have blackout any time. So for those which says that more renewable means less grid, it's absolutely wrong. More renewable means more investment in grid. So you require more grid, but more intelligence in grid to, able, to be able to manage the, the loads and to manage the demand. And is it more distributed? Does that increase but the that pressure? More distributed means more, uh, immediate, more, more means for managing all this energy. Right. Because if not, I think you can already have any time problems of supply or problems of blackouts. I think the, the frequencies can already change and already you have already blackout rapidly. You are not already managing properly that one. So I think uh, more renewable means more investment in grid. I think their example of uh, Hawaii. In Hawaii have already make an extensive deployment of renewable distributed uh, uh, renewables. What happened? They have a tremendous problem of supply, and they require much more investment in grid to, to balance and to manage and that. And indeed, Hawaii is talking about needing to bring in LNG uh, to help balance out the, yeah, manage so, the grid. So, so that's an area that Hitachi is focused on, yeah, is managing. And also that uh, the, the, Mr. Gallen uh, pointed out, that's uh, efficiency of the electric utility yeah. grid uh, completely changed, the meaning sure. completely changed. Used to be the uh, huge power generator, how to distribute it, but this model is no more. So let me, uh, Hitachi of course is in nuclear. In fact, uh, you're designing a new nuclear power plant for the United Kingdom. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, uh, two nuclear power plants have come back into operation in Japan. Tell us what your view is, and maybe we'll then ask Fatih to say, the role of nuclear, uh, both in Japan and globally. Is, is nuclear part of the energy transformation uh, for, the, for the future? The first of all, the, uh, you know, that, uh, in Japan, so we have uh, so many the, uh, you know, that, uh, debates <laughs> still. <laughs> but, but now, the, uh, from the viewpoint of the uh, technology and the economical reasons, nuclear power is the most effective power sources and stable and uh, very much in you know, contiguous operations is impossible. This is a, a kind of the uh, basic power source. So, so the, uh, we cannot expect it of the rapid increase of the nuclear power generating uh, the, the powers, but, but now the, uh, how to maintain it, how to safer, 
uh, yeah, such a very stable parcel. So that's uh, the very special you know, power uh, portfolios factor. Now that's, uh, we believe so, so that we would like to extend of this type of the uh, uh, nu nuclear technology, which we learned a lot from the uh, Fukushima uh, to, to making a more safe operation. So we would like to extend this type of the technology development. Right. Uh, Fatih, where, when you do the energy balances and talk about an energy transformation, where does nuclear fit in? A nuclear still has an important role. But before that, Dan, you and uh, uh, Mr. Gallan mentioned a point. I want to come to that brief on renewables. Now, years and years, we, the discussion was, is renewables good or bad? Does it make sense or, or not? Does it economic or not? Now, I think we all, when we look at the numbers, last year, half of the all new power plants come on stream were renewables, other half, so 50% renewables, other 50% coal plus gas plus oil plus nuclear put together. So half of the all new installed capacity 2015 were renewables. So first of all, renewables are not anymore a romantic story. It's a mainstream fuel and this phase is it's over. It's his big business. Exactly. <laughs> this phase is over. Second, bulk of the new installations do not come from Europe or United States. More than two thirds of it come from the emerging countries. China, India, Brazil, and other countries. So in the past, it was the Europe, US were the driving forces. Now the driving forces are the emerging countries. Three, in the past, renewables growth were driven by the hydropower. Now it is wind and solar. What does it mean? It means the following. Now the phase of the early years are over. Now the big challenge is how to integrate the renewables in the energy system. And this is a complex issue. This is not an easy issue. We, as the International Energy Agency, we are putting a lot of resources how to integrate the renewables in the energy system because there are many challenges in terms of the resilience of the systems. Renewables are good, nice, but they come up with a lot of problems. So, so Fatih, what you've said is the renewable age is, the remote, romantic age in renewables is over. over exactly. But if you take the 1% of wind and solar and the 80%, exactly. go out 20 or 30 years, kind of where do they, where's, where's the meeting point or, uh, the, or the balance? <coughs> when uh, we started with the, with the uh, Paris, when you look at the government submissions, so the government targets, they are mainly based on increasing share of renewables and increasing energy efficiency. If we believe that the governments reach their targets, then uh, we will see more than two thirds of the all new power plants will be renewables in the next 15 years, the new installations. Right. But, what will but be the, still, the, 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 uh, the fossil fuels will be the dominating force. Will so still we be in, still dominating in, force in, in how many years? In, in how many? 2030. If we want to in, 20, do, in 2030. 2030. If we want to reach the targets of Paris, which are tremendously strong targets, we not only push renewables and efficiency, but in my view, we have to put a ban on the inefficient, subcritical coal-fired power plants. So we have to do two things at the same time. So does, Otherwise, it will be impossible uh, to reach a target. So do you, does the IEA have a number, 20, 40, 20, 50, what the balance between conventional and renewables? What we have to see, if we want to reach the two degrees target, at least 40% of the energy needs to come from the zero emission technologies, which includes, in addition to renewables, nuclear power, uh, so nuclear, you see, is, is part of the... Uh, currently, the nuclear power is 72 power plants are under construction, but 40% are only in China. Right. China is the manufacturer of nuclear power, and as such, China is becoming, very soon, an exporter of nuclear technology competing with Japan, with yeah. France, and other countries, because the cost of nuclear is going down. The more they do it, the lower the prices go and they will make it much more accessible. Right. So you mentioned uh, in passing this uh, phrase called natural gas. Yes. If you look at the United States, the way it, it brought down its emissions so dramatically was natural gas pushing coal out of the energy mix. The, where does natural gas play its role, in, in any of you, uh, on, in, in the energy transformation? I think natural gas can play a <coughs> positive role if it replaces coal, like in the United States. If we see a big drop in the U.S. today, emissions, 
uh, almost 10 years low, driven by two things. One, the efficiency, and the second, uh, gas replacing coal. Mm. But how it happened, two things. One, the gas prices are low. Second, there was a presidential decree in the United States, uh, which had uh, put uh, difficulties for coal, uh, as you know uh, uh, better than me then, which is a, a tough subject in the United States. I like you. Normally we say a, 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 an executive order, but you call it a presidential decree, but it's actually the, the same thing. Mr. Lowe, uh, what's China's role going to be in the global renewable business? And where does this fit into all of the arguments around trade and uh, tariffs and, and protection? I think, I think the role China is going to play, as uh, we, we talk about solar, I think solar, China will play a leading role to continue to drive down the cost of products and systems. And uh, in terms of renewable energy, I think China has a big, big ambition, which announced, President Xi announced in the United Nations Assembly last year. China is determined to build the, what we call global <coughs> internet energy connections, right? It's working with the China grid well, so what that means for the global internet energy connections I mean, it has three key elements. The one it's el the global in internet energy connections, which the president here announced, and also the chairman of Chinese state grid announced yeah. and several times. So there's three key elements for this mission to be played in the global energy or global renewable energy. Number one is renewable energy. Okay, that's that's the key elements. It's not going to be fossil fuel or conventional energy. Number two is what the Chinese called high voltage trans transmission lines, okay, which started with regional and uh, intercontinental and eventually it's global. Number three is going to be smart grid solutions, okay, not just for the uh, micro grid, but also for the distributed generation. I think those kind of roles China is going to play. But in, in terms of the, the trade protections, uh, I was heavily involved in the trade negotiation with China, US, and China. And how's it yeah. going? It's, it's not going well. <laughs> but, but we are here. We, are, we were in Dali and to talk about the collaboration and the cooperation. We are here to talk about how we deploy the renewable energy in a global scale. Okay? I think the trade protection is not a win-win for either side. Okay? This is going to be global business, and it's going to be global missions. So personally, I'm strong against any kind of trade protection. Okay. How much of the global market for solar panels is provided by China? Roughly 65 to 70 percent. 65 to 70 percent as of today. But and growing? At, uh, China, Chinese domestic manufacturing is, is stabilized, and the Chinese is uh, expanding this manufacturing, what we call global manufacturing footprint repositioning, okay. like in Malaysia. Thailand, Vietnam. You saw it, Vietnam has built three, four gigawatt solar manufacturing last year. Is there still overcapacity in China, or is that finished? No, under the trade protection, promised their excess capacity in Chinese domestic manufacturing. But overall, whether if you include offshore manufacturing, like the Chinese they invest <coughs> in Malaysia, Vietnam, Thailand, I don't think it's, a, it's a really excess if you compare so supply four, demand. Four gigawatts. How much is any of that yours? No, we are we are on 1.6 gigawatt. That's our solar asset. Right. We become the largest private company investment in the solar farm project. Okay, right. but in terms of monitoring, we are the global largest monitoring renewable energy companies. Our German subsidiary is called Miro Control. They are monitoring 40,000 systems and 16 gigawatt as of today. When you say monitoring, what do you monitoring? Monitoring the renewable energy generations. Oh. So, and we we talk about the how we work with grid to balance those risk. I'll give you one example. Our German subsidiary media control, they work with the German electric environment last April to forecast the solar eclipse, what is the renewable energy generation. So we provide our 45 minutes, 99% precise modeling about the solar generation during the solar eclipse, which happened last April. Right. So then regularly, Invite regular agencies, they will have enough time to prepare, to adjust, to adapt this uh, natural right. and uh, did, phenomenon. They, I presume they did a good job of, of forecasting. Course. So now we are working with the Chinese state grid companies yeah. to build a sophisticated modeling about renewable energy generation, wind and solar of China. And as you heard, the China has power containment issues for renewable energy. One time investment is, right. is power containment. So we are working, that's, that's because 
no one has a good forecast model. That's related to our mission is how the digital, the data mining of the weather and our expertise in the weather related data forecast can right. provide a sophisticated modeling for the renewable energy generation, which <coughs> can mitigate the issues right. of the grid load. So you put on the table, and already Mr. Nakanishi did it, the question of the new digital technologies and, and capabilities that are needed as we move into a renewable area. Uh, Mr. Galan, you said big issue, carbon tax is, is needed. Carbon price. Uh, carbon price, yes, carbon price, not a tax. Um, there's a third thing out there, which is called batteries, storage. And I'd like to ask Mr. Nakanishi to say, what's the role of storage? How do you, as a technology company, see this, the, the battery, uh, the state of battery research? Are we there? And Mr. Galan, you said you spent 15 years of your life designing batteries, so you can bring us up to date after Mr. Nakanishi. Yeah. <laughs> the stability and the cost of the battery is uh, really, really high. That's the background why we cannot set up the uh, more appropriate uh, locations of the battery arrangement. But now the, the, the cost is getting the, uh, the dynamically slow, uh, low, lowering, and so that we can have the various, you know, different type of the storage, uh, uh, the storage systems uh, distributions. The, also, that uh, I, I would like to point it out that the uh, such kind of the power storage behavior is really the uh, suit to the, uh, the the highly distributed power sources. The solar or winds, or those type of the renewables, should be allocated in a more distributed way. It's just uh, not like uh, huge power generating stations. So that's uh, you know more the, the cost effective allocation of the battery is one of the, uh, the very important field for the future stabi stabilizing of the electric grid behavior. So we are now challenging of the, uh, the, the, the capacity-wise of the more easy installations of the battery systems, but the, uh, just a starting uh, point right now, so that we should have a more dynamic you know, the usage of those types. Also, that the battery cost is fully related to the electric vehicles technology. The, the, maybe the, the largest capacity of the battery will be consumed for the electric vehicles. Those of the aut aut uh, automotive industry is uh, a very, uh, the, the motive force for the uh, developing of the technology and the uh, cost downs. So I'm very optimistic to set up the... Do you, I mean, is it something where you think there'll be one day we'll wake up and there'll be a breakthrough, or do you think it's a kind of evolutionary progress? Ah, it's a very stepwise from the viewpoint of the cost uh, in, in efficiencies. So, Mr. Galan, as a battery designer, can well, you Well, I think that was in? 40 years ago when I started already my professional <laughs> you, career. I started already today, as battery engineer, so yes. that was already a long, long time ago. But nevertheless, still I revise something of this. So uh, uh, the, the first thing, uh, I think you mentioned something. As more intermittent or not predictable technology you have in the system, as more we need some kind of devices for storage, the energy in excess, and for, pro, uh, and for providing energy when their, this demand appears. So uh, uh, what is already today the most efficient for the developed countries? Those countries we have already today, just a grid. We have today already just uh, a, 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 already a demand in the different places. What is the most efficient manner? The most efficient manner of, of storing is pumping storage. Hydro pumping storage. I think if we transform. Maybe just take another sentence to explain what it is. So it's very simple. It's to use the dams instead of producing in one single direction the, 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 the generation, just taking the water from the top up to the bottom, is to take the water from the bottom to the top. Transform the generator in a, mo in, in a motor. So in such a way that you can already generate in some time. But you need a lot of hydro. Well, you need a dam and yeah. you need two dams. So you and have you to play into dams. And you need permission to build I think the dam. I, I have to say, I, I, with Fatid, I think we have already talked about that. And I think he has a great idea. I already, already repeated your idea. I think it's uh, uh, today in Europe, in the existing uh, uh, hydropower plants, if you transform the existing power plant into reversible turbines, the turbines which can already generate or can already pump in both directions. 
So you can store it massively, that one. Only one single power plant. I think we have already one of those we have in Spain. So only one is more than a million homes with their own batteries. So I think if we see how many batteries have to be established with one single power plant, you can already store it with one. With a cost much, much, much lower. It's six, seven times cheaper than another system. But the second thing on this is something, something that, that he mentioned. And batteries, I'm sure then is going to be needed in due time. I'm not doubt. I think I'm sure that the economy has to be much more electrified. And transport is one of the areas we have to be much more electrified. And batteries have to play a role. Do you see, I mean, do you put a time frame on not the pump storage, which is here and now, but the kind of batteries that you need for large scale renewable? Well, is I, it five I, years away, I, 10 I years think, away? I think for years? large scale renewable, you can already make this easily with pumping and storage. I think. Uh, 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 in, in emerging countries, we have not grid. They have to make everything from zero. But in the country, we have already the grid. And you put already digitalization in the grid. And you put intelligence in the grid. You can move the load from so, one side to another. One so you're side. not saying then that, 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 the, that it's a gating obstacle that you need a new battery? No, I, I just saying that they cannot compete right. uh, today and for a long time with technologies which are by far more mature and more larger the scale. It's the same thing with the, in, the, in, the, in the solar panels. There are a good <coughs> analysis made by MIT about what is better to use the solar panel in the centralized installation or distributed installation. And it's 80% cheaper centralized and distributed. So, which I think is why, obvious. Why is distributed, though, much more popular with the public? Well, I, I, I think in most cases, yes, because of the regulation. Regulation is helping a lot of that one. I think you have already just a, 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 a net, uh, um, how you call uh, net metering. Net balance, ba yeah. net dial balance or net metering. So I think you are not paying the grid. You are benefiting at the grid with the paying nothing. Or even in some cases, you are already sending subsidies, very huge subsidies for that one, and you are not paying the grid. So I think they are, let's say, in artificial competition. So let me ask you a question before we open it up to conversation. Do you think that five years from now, a lot of the focus will be not just on renewables versus conventional, but distributed versus grid? No, I don't think so. I think both are needed. I think the world will need more and more clean energy. So distributed energy has already, they will play the role, and it will be needed in certain areas, certain places, no doubt. And batteries can be used in certain areas, in certain places, no doubt. Uh, concentrated energy will be needed. In certain places, in certain places, uh, for certain uh, purposes, pumping and storage have to play the role. All they have their own role. I think one is going to, to, to substitute another one. Both are is going to be needed. Solar is going to be needed, right. centralized, and solar will be needed already distributed. A, a, a wind will be already large scale wind farm as is today, onshore and offshore. Both will be needed. So. I think, according with your, your numbers, right. the demand in the next 25 years in electricity in the world is going to, to increase by 80% if we would like to right. achieve the targets of the carbonization. So 80% right. increase in demand means everything will be needed. The right. point is to use that one, right. and that is the report we are producing this year here in, in our, right. our group. In Davos, is precisely to make, not to repeat the mistake, we have already made someone, is to make the things in a manner will be competitive, right. Uh, in a way that will be not needed as uh, right. any kind of subsidy. So I'm going to open it up, but I'm going to uh, just have to ask uh, 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 Fadi one last question before we do, which is just to go back to oil. Is it a, you know, normally two years ago, three years ago, people would have said a cut in oil prices is great for the world economy. It doesn't necessarily look so great now. Why is that for me? <laughs> I think it, is, uh, it depends on who you are. For some, it's a good news, for some, it's a bad news. But it turns out it's more but, of a bad news for more people than it appeared. Exactly. To. So, for example, Middle East. We know the Middle East. Uh, yeah. Middle East. I tell you one number. Uh, if the oil prices remain around $30, 2016, an equivalent of 20% of the Middle East GDP will be raised. It's a big thing. For Russia, about 10% equivalent of Russian GDP will be raised in 2016 if the prices remain at this level. But at the same time, for Europe, for China, for India, it's economic stimulus. But is it, but not as, I mean, if you look at the fin global financial markets, something is happening there. It would have been, I think, worse 
if you were in this financial situation with higher oil price, it provided the support uh, there. But uh, then, so are two different things going on at the exactly. same time. Exactly, and and but two uh, two things. One, as I mentioned, this low oil prices translating in the very low, unprecedented low oil investments mean we are also having a fertile ground in the future, strong rebound of the prices. Right, this as is you one. said before. Second, the topic of our discussion, transformation of energy, I think low energy prices are complicating that transformation. So we have to also put this in a context, and therefore there is a need for governments to be very awake in the presence of the low uh, oil prices if they are serious about Paris. So what should they do? I think they should, if they have regulations, if they have new policies, they have to stick to them. They shouldn't get relaxed because the uh, energy prices are low. They don't have the impetus of saving so you, money. So you mean more presidential decrees? <laughs> or, uh, or, or executive orders. <laughs> right. Okay, let's open it up. I can't see everybody, but uh, short questions from the floor right there. Everything has to be tight. Hi, Anirudh from Carbon Clean Solutions. Just uh, identify yourself. Uh, Anirudh from Carbon Clean Solutions. The question is, a major part of energy transformation is industry. How do you see industry using energy transforming over a period of time? Number one. Number two, do you think carbon capture and reuse storage has a part to play in it? Thank okay. you. Okay. Let's get a couple more questions. Uh, hi. Uh, you're... Jürgen Grossman, I used to be with a big energy producer, but now I'm just an energy consumer. Now, uh, what you're telling me here is a great uh, future, of course, but uh, when I look at the forwards in the uh, European power exchange now, uh, in three years, four years, electricity will cost, what, 25 euros per uh, megawatt hour, which is very low. Now, how do you judge, uh, how, how do you justify all that new investment, uh, you know, into storage and so on, when the existing system still provides such cheap power that really uh, no economic justification can be made for any of those investments. Okay. One more question, then we'll go right there. My name is uh, Komo Daman. I'm the chairman of uh, one of the largest shipyards in the world. Uh, I wonder, uh, I would like to, to have a comment to one of the uh, members of, the, of this uh, forum on the future of uh, tidal energy. I didn't you didn't mention that right okay so the question is what is industry doing about carbon and changing uh its energy mix which maybe is a question for you mr naknishi um how do you justify these new investments when electricity is cheap and what about tidal power so do you want to take the industrial question the uh the from the viewpoint of the manufacturing industry that total environment of the business are changed. So the, uh, that, uh, the, not simply of the, uh, that, uh, the power generating or switches or transformer. So those kind of the, uh, the equipment the producing is not a major part of our business. It's how to set up the new the, the generation of the total system is one of their targets. That's uh, from the viewpoint of providers. But now, the simultaneously, the electric utility operation also the change in very dynamically. That already, the Mr. Gallon explained of the, uh, the the source of that. But uh, it's a very small part of that. The Mr. Ruo also talked about uh, the the China's great experiment for how to the world largest electric grid, the state grid, is taking a strong initiative to set up the uh, the various technology combined. That cannot be seen in the other world. So the other, really, what I want to say, that's a very dynamic change of the total environment. That's uh, my, the, uh, the, the recognition of this stage. Right. So the question about how do you justify these investments in new power when the power cost looks like it's going to be pretty low? Well, I think that is, uh, uh, Jürgen, that is precisely what is happening in Britain. So I think you are just making a very good example. So Britain is a country which has already the reserve margin is very low, so uh, they are already the prices are not very attractive, and no one is making already new investment unless they are already somebody means uh, through a regulated uh, means just uh, already providing and, and guaranteeing certain level of price. So I think it's been making investment is going to be made investment in nuclear with a, a guarantee price. 
it are being made investment in uh, in renewable onshore and offshore with a guarantee price, but it's not been made no one in uh, in coal power plants or in a combined cycle of gas or whatever another one which are already just market only with the ma the market prices. Okay. So I think even they are already making some kind of bids for those ones. The price which are being achieved for those bids for giving already certain capacity pay payments are not big enough for, for justifying already new power right. plants. Do you want to add anything? Yes, I think that that's uh, it's it's a great question, but really depends on the region. The renewable energy the the structure has a huge difference between region and regions. I think for the European and for the US. Uh, Okay, I think keeping in mind a couple of things. One is that the efficiency is going up. The capex for the project investment is coming down dramatically. As I predict for the next five years, it's going to be 25 to 35% down. Okay. Then also the interest rate is being very stable in the low range. So if you add all that, and I think the European and the US, I think people will continue to invest in this distributed generation. But for some other region like Southeast Asia or the Ocean Island countries, those area, because I've been to Nepal, Cambodia, Indonesia a lot. If you go there, okay, if you go to Nepal, every single commercial facility has the diesel powered right. backup, right? And you stay five-star hotel, you always, you always see the, the, the kickback between the grip and the diesel, diesel backup engines, right? So if you see those areas, I think electricity, I don't see any chance they can come down. I was in Cambodia last, last month, more than 90% of the village people, they don't have access to the power, but the, at the city, the 25 right. US cents kilowatt hour, they say the rich people can afford to pay. In those areas, I think, with the, with the system coming down, the capex, I think the way it justified right. the, the new investment for that, for right. even, even the cost is wrong. So, so who wants to take tidal power? May I just say something on Europe? Just one uh, line. If you do, then you also have to take tidal uh, okay. power. Okay, this is bad, <laughs> bad luck. So this is, uh, now, uh, for Europe, I completely agree with uh, Herr Grossman. Now, uh, I think there is a need for, uh, to reform the European electricity markets. Mm -hmm. This is otherwise, uh, it is not an investable market. You talk about gas, uh, uh, then, look, European gas used today, as of this year, is 20% lower than 2008. So this is amazing. So this, is, uh, this gives us a, an idea where the European uh, gas markets go, and when you look at the prices, I don't know who would make an investment just based on the market condition. So this is number one. Number two, untitled. Uh, this is a, a, a technology which is trying to find the niche in the electricity markets. There are encouraging developments in uh, different countries, including Australia, New Zealand, and some uh, European countries. But once again, the new technologies, the technologies who don't have a strong penetration power now need government support. And this low uh, energy prices complicates that support. Therefore, I wouldn't think that the, the, the tidal power, the ocean uh, power, will make a major uh, improvement in the next right. years to come. So I saw one question over here. Uh, are there some right here? And are there some others back here? Anybody? Uh, he needs a mic, please. Okay. Uh, John Mogg. I'm chair of the, uh, the Council of, for the Future of Energy for the World Forum, but I'm also former GB energy regulator and currently the chair of Board of Regulators for the Energy Agency in Europe. And I don't speak purely as an energy regulator, but I'm very interested, given the importance of stability, predictability in terms of a regime, how, what threat there is in terms of investment, uh, future investment, particularly of the sort of, sorts of size that have been mentioned, with the threats of political intervention and threats to the independent of re energy regulators around the world. By political intervention, what do you mean? I mean, well, I mean, be, greater, be explicit. <laughs> uh, well, I can be. In some countries, energy re in, within Europe, some countries have replaced their energy regulator some 10 or 12 times during the course of the year because of unpopular decisions. Around the world, there are instances where governments are taking a much greater role in terms of running, regulating energy companies, but also in terms of defining the investment conditions which discourage investment, particularly in renewable energy. Oh, by, by, discour by discouraging, you mean by 
pushing in lower prices than regulators want? Or well, by having regulated prices, which are usually rules. low prices, right. or by setting rules that are too difficult, or by protecting incumbents. Okay. And over there, our friend from Tokyo Gas. Uh, Meraki of Tokyo Gas, and uh, you're talking about the renewal of the grid system, and I think it's the smart grid and smart uh, storage technologies are important to utilize and renewal of the efficiently. However, one of the obstacles to utilize the renewables in the global basis is the distance between the area of intensive solar energies and uh, wind energies and demand side. So to transport those renewables by grid system doesn't make sense. So there could be the carriers, energy carriers, like right, convert to the hydrogen, convert to the chemicals or ammonia or something else and, and transport to the uh, demand side. That could be the one of areas uh, the global industry need to explore. Anybody uh, right. comment on that? So is there one more question? If I don't see any other, then we'll go to that. On the regulators, I guess um, it's this side of the room, should I? <laughs> <So>. <laughs> and the most regulated. We defend the or we. I think we'd want, we want some defensive regulators. So, uh, no, well, I think, I think something that uh, 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 John Moore uh, uh, is already mentioning is true. The level of increased intervention in very many countries uh, uh, to reduce the independence of the regulators is something which is happening. So, and that is not a good, a good sign for already incentivating the investment. We investors, we prefer uh, a professional independent regulator better than uh, a, a, a government, whatever it should be, with the established rules, but they can change the rules anytime they would like. And the fact, in many, many cases, the rules in certain countries has been changed uh, even after the investment has been made. With that is not giving precisely already the certainty with investment we require long, long-term maturity need. So uh, I think I fully uh, subscribe the point that he mentioned. And I think European Commission is already moving forward this direction. So the, the, the Vice President of the, uh, for the European Energy Union is already working precisely in that one. Just trying to make a level playing field and just to avoid the, the intervention of the countries, of the government, the countries can really change the rules, whatever they would like. I think that is something which we have to be aware of. In the documents we are already producing here in the World Economic Forum last year, so we precisely we are saying that uh, uh, that is something we have to be already just uh, minimize this intervention. Right. Let me add something on this. I mean, just one, I, I completely agree. But in terms of renewables, coming back to the, uh, our uh, discussion here, I think the changing policies, changing regulators is a killer. And uh, people talk about the, the main challenge in front of the renewables is the unpredictability. But I think bigger challenge is not the unpredictability of renewables, <laughs> but the unpredictability of the policies on renewables. I agree. So I agree. just wanted I agree. to say that. Right, uh, fluctuations. Uh, just we'll try and get the uh, we'll try and get the metaphor right. But exactly, uh, Mr. Meraki uh, raised the question about the distance between the generation sites and the load centers, and how to mediate them, and whether what type of technology. Obviously, one is uh, is the, the grids that you described, ultra high. But but do you all want to just take that question? Yeah, that's uh, very much in a complicated uh, environment issues. Uh, in the case of the uh, Europe, uh, really the, to, uh, not easy to connect of the uh, northern part to wind power to the uh, southern part. That's uh, not simply economical reasons. It's a kind of the uh, natural reserve, reserve. So those uh, the conditions to be considered. And uh, But now the, in the case of the China, is really the setting up the HVDC to connect of the uh, directory is uh, one of the, uh, the maybe from the viewpoint of the economy, that's the wisest way to, to set up that. Is it possible or not? So the, uh, of course, some of the, uh, the chemical conversions of the energy to, to the, uh, some of the uh, ammonia or hydro, those kinds of technology also that some area is a just a fit. So that uh, today's discussion is we need uh, very diversified energy source is a future, our future. 
and also that uh, some of the transportation or electric management schemes is also that the diverse way to be adapt uh, uh, setting up the, uh, the various future possibility. So Mr. Nakanishi, one thing uh, we haven't talked about are fuel cells. That's a subject of great interest in Japan. Do you, does Hitachi have a view on the future of the fuel cell in this mix? Oh yes, of course, the uh, fuel is uh, the, the strongest driver. It's not so clear yet. The, so the, from the uh, pure energy side, and also that uh, I'm already talking about uh, batteries uh, fully dependent on the automotive area, but, uh, but uh, simultaneously the, such a uh, fuel the, uh, battery is one of the, uh, the important technology. So in this case also that uh, the, the, the very much of diversified technology development is required. Uh, yeah. I think that the point of transportation, I think it's, uh, 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 it's true. Then the, for long, long distance, I think we have to, to look for the most efficient manner. But I think it's already been uh, used, uh, especially in the offshore uh, uh, wind farms. Uh, it's already high, high voltage DC as a, as a mean, which is more, ef more efficient, less costly, and uh, with less losses than another uh, system with uh, AC. So, which I think is something which is solutions, which is solutions which are efficient, especially for, for big powers. I think you cannot use these sort of things for making a small installation. You have to make already a critical mass which justify the transmission. But when you have a critical mass, I think it's, it's able to be made, and today it's been made, in most of the uh, uh, offshore wind farm, then we are already investing in the in the in the in the North Sea. So I think it's a, it's a solution which is already economically efficient. That one more than another solution of a story. Yeah. So uh, uh, overall, we are seeing a, a clear shift in the globally from the large scale utility to the distributed generation, the solar business. Even in China, 2016, they set up a target. The distributed generation is the first time is going to overtake uh, the percentage wise overtake the large scale utilities. The percentage of? It's, it's 65% versus 35%. The 35% of 2016, we have the large scale utility, and 65% of the installation we have deployed at a distribution level, distributed generation level. Okay. So for Southeast Asia, I see clearly the distributed generation combined with the low cost storage is the only solution it's apparent they are not going to build a high voltage transmission right. area, particularly for the island oceans. Right. Yeah, so the, uh, the, today uh, I want to emphasize of the, uh, such a, you know, the more complicated solutions required to set up the energy. That's uh, one of the big difference from the conventional issues, the how to combine of the various you know, power source, uh, how to manage of the, uh, the, cons the consumer side, the, the, such a very much a systematic approach is a, one of the, uh, the big, you know, the challenge of the digital technology. But now the uh, setting up the, the total system is a very much a political issues. And so the, uh, we need to have a very sh share of the, such kind of the future steps for the, uh, the making a improvement of this right. uh, total system. Right. So I think, I think in this point, so, something which he insisted before, and I would like to insist, I think demand, according to your estimate, in the next 25 years, next 25 years, <coughs> the demand of electricity is increasing by 80%. So means all solution, all technology will be needed if we would like to supply what the world will demand. Still there are 1,200 million people without access right. to electricity. That's why when you mentioned these countries. Right. So uh, all solution will be needed, right. all technology will be needed. It's not one against another, all will be needed. Right using in the different places. In the developed countries, we have to use one technology or one system. In the developed countries, another one. But all will be needed. In no, we will not already be able to provide the electricity in the world we require. Right. So let me thank uh, the panelists for a very good discussion, uh, a very timely discussion uh, that was made so relevant by the events in Paris of, of a month ago. And I think that Paris uh, has uh, obviously put the issue, has been transforming in putting the issue of transformation of the energy system on the agenda. And I think in this discussion, we've uh, illuminated many aspects of it and thank the panelists and thank those for the questions and those who have joined us on the web. I think one conclusion that comes from it is, uh, while um, the word transformation is a, is a single word, it's a word with many, many moving parts. One of the things that we've come away from it with is that there's a need for a lot of technologies to connect these moving parts as the scale increases, but it's a, it's a, it's a story both of moving parts, but at the same point, it has a, a lot of 
embedded uh, parts and a lot of embedded history, which will make this a very uh, complex uh, uh, transformation as we move forward. And I thank you all for this discussion today. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.